Thank you. Well, I think we have got a, a good act to follow. We're now going to meet uh, the chief executive of Aer Lingus, uh, Christoph Muller. So, Christoph, if you'd like to uh, join me on the stage. We have an Irish theme for the next 15 minutes. We're going to get to Christoph first and uh, his perspective on, on Aer Lingus, followed by uh, Ken O'Toole from Ryanair. Well, Christoph, I was talking to you early on this morning, and uh, I would say you could describe yourself as maybe a man of the world, a man of the aviation world. You've been around the track. You were telling me you've been at Aer Lingus now two years. Do you regret that you took the, the decision to go there, given all the things that are on your plate at the present time? No, uh, certainly not. Uh, we are making good progress, and uh, there was a lot of of debate about the different models, uh, legacy, low cost. Uh, we describe ourselves as profitable, and I believe that is the best place to be. Okay. Well, we heard in the last, uh, the last session about uh, everybody's respective elephants in the room. Can we just tackle yours? I would say you have a couple. You, we yeah, have, we uh, have quite a few. Let's look at two specific ones. We, we have talk, although I'm not certain that it's been confirmed, the Irish government may, uh, as part of its debt reduction program, look to sell its remaining stake in Aer Lingus. Uh, then you have the stake uh, of your larger shareholder, uh, perhaps a, a parallel issue which uh, EasyJet's dealing with, which is Ryanair. Mm. Uh, would the Irish government be better off just to sell that stake, let Ryanair have the, the way which Michael Leary has long wanted and, and just buy you up uh, lock, stock mm. and barrel? Well, just to recall, the Irish government privatized Aer Lingus in 2006, and uh, I believe it has always been the intention to absolutely spin it off entirely. Uh, there were two rationals, in fact, uh, preventing the, uh, the government of stepping out entirely and, and retaining the 25%, one of which was uh, to protect uh, Aer Lingus from a hostile takeover from Ryanair. Uh, everybody knows there were two attempts, um, the OFT and the, uh, the legislation in, in, in Brussels will certainly prohibit that in the future, so that reason is gone. Uh, secondly, um, of course, it's uh, understandable that a nation living on an island uh, perceives air traffic like a highway, like a motorway, and uh, there, there, I believe, is a good reasons to be made that the connectivity, particularly between the UK, uh, where just in London are, are more Irish people than in the Republic, uh, that this highway is maintained, so there were some uh, reservations with regard to the slot utilization. Also, that is now resolved, and the Minister uh, said last week there is no strategic rational to maintain the 25% and uh, the government decided to sell it uh, once the last obstacles are removed. Okay. I mean, but let's put cards on the table. I mean, Michael O'Leary has had this long-cherished ambition. They've uh, issued some more moderate statements recently. They, they've been thwarted mm. by regulatory uh, aspects in terms of uh, getting a majority shareholding. But if, uh, if it is not uh, to, go to fall into the hands of Ryanair, who else might be interested? Because we have one of your predecessors, Willie Walsh, seemingly in the press in the last few days saying he's not interested because of the big pension deficit. We have Air France KLM uh, being slammed mm. by the financial analysts so, over high costs and a whole host of business issues. And we have a new CEO in Lufthansa coming in saying now's the time to consolidate and focus on organic growth. Mm. Those would have seemed to me to perhaps be the alternative grouping. So would, would another airline be interested? I will, that, that I think is a conclusion um, which is not going too far. Number one, I mean a listed company is for sale every day. That's the nature of the game and people need to understand that our shares are traded in, in London and in Dublin every day. So who is ultimately owning the company is a question of price. Um, we recently announced that we are not going to join one of the three alliances. And that's the reason why to focus just on the three leading legacy carriers in Europe as a potential buyer is, is not uh, correct or not the right conclusion. People have not understood our business model. Uh, we are connecting Ireland with the world. Uh, we are in mobile phone terms, if you wish, the only roaming partner available uh, to get to and from the Ireland. And so we have to be open uh, to the entire industry. We have co-chair and interline agreements across the alliance world uh, with legacy carriers, with JetBlue, uh, um, uh, with, with all different kinds of business model. Uh, we don't make it a religion. We want to make money and uh, that a majority shareholder will understand. If, if a majority shareholder steps in and prevents us on, on, on doing our business, uh, connecting 70 million Irish people living uh, all over the world with the Republic, 
um, then it's just a bad call. But are you saying, though, that against that, perhaps uh, given the logic of those three big groups, if it's not Ryanair mm. uh, and it's not one of those three, are you saying that one of these other diverse partners we shouldn't rule out uh, having a financial interest in the company? Well, of course, I mean, uh, it's a good deal. Uh, I have to, I have to uh, reiterate that. We made a margin of 5%, which is in the upper 10% uh, percent in, in the global aviation industry. Our second quarter was delivering 7.4% uh, margin. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's just a good value proposition. And um, Thomas said earlier, uh, Lufthansa is, is floated. I think the largest shareholder in Lufthansa, I, I haven't checked it, I hope I don't say it's the wrong thing, is certainly not larger than 3%. Um, that's the nature of a listed company. And uh, we are all focused now on the elephants in the room. Um, is it a good value proposition for the remaining shareholder? I believe a full free float is, is, is the best way to go. And what about uh, the day-to-day -day relationship with Ryanair as a shareholder? We see the very public statements, I think, again, in the last week. Uh, it's a true love uh, affair. I can imagine it is. Yeah. Uh, I see uh, Michael O'Leary is believing you're very much in a position to hand out a, a healthy dividend to shareholders at the moment, for example. Um, in, in all honesty, the shareholding of Ryanair, I believe, is, uh, is a sexier subject in the, in the press. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, Ryanair is our strongest competitor. We have a root overlap of 85%. So on 85% of all routes, Ryanair is my main competitor. That keeps me on the toes. Uh, that's good for us. Uh, it, it keeps the cost low and uh, the people awake at night. And uh, in, in that respect, the shareholding of Ryanair, uh, for me, is almost an historical issue now. Okay. Coming back to that time, as I mentioned, when you joined Aer Lingus um, two years ago, and uh, if we think back several more years <coughs> than that, uh, Aer Lingus could have been seen as perhaps a, a dinosaur, a basket case that wasn't <laughs> going to be around. Then it went through the, the radical changes uh, brought in by, by Willie Walsh uh, to turn mm. it into practically a pseudo low-cost carrier, taking as, as many elements of a mantra as it could at that time. And I think uh, uh, you weren't here yesterday, but we had Alex Cruz, who was just on the panel, did credit Aer Lingus as being one of the few legacy airlines that had managed to turn around and, and reshape itself into a low-cost model. You've come in and seemingly on the face of it are, are taking the company in a different direction. Mm. Does that mean you're trying to put, again, we had a lot of discussion just now about complexity. Are you trying to put complexity back in, put it back on the, the high-end uh, curtains, caviar, business class approach? No, not, not necessarily. I mean, absolutely right. It was a shock therapy uh, back in 2001, 2002. Um, Aer Lingus truly became a low-cost carrier and still is. Just to remind, we lowered our cost base over the last 18 months by another 10%. Unit cost is even uh, declining more rapidly. Uh, we will at the end of next year reach the unit cost level of, of EasyJet. And I have to admit it's a little bit flawed because we have a couple of long-haul aircraft distorting a little bit the denominator. But nevertheless, I think it's a good achievement for a 75-year-old grandma. Um, what was wrong was the revenue side. Uh, the cost side is not um, is, is very competitive. Uh, nothing is really uh, entirely wrong, but the fees in um, in Dublin Airport. Um, the revenue side, in fact, I think we followed a little bit too much the Me Too. The the customer in Ireland had no choice. They had they had Ryan and Elingus, and both were crappy service. Um, so people want more. And we leave it to their distinction to pick from a menu of a modular product build-up. And uh, let, me, let me try to explain in, in what environment we are operating. We have a shuttle between Dublin and Heathrow uh, on an hourly basis uh, almost. Uh, these flights are, I would say, 80-85% business-related, time-sensitive mm -hmm. travelers. Um, if you take that flight in the morning, you see attaché cases, uh, people are, want to leave left alone, maybe a cup of coffee, newspaper, but most important, they want a fast track security, they want lounge access, and they want, surprisingly, miles and more, or frequent fly or loyalty points. Uh, th you can buy all that. The same aircraft returns to Dublin and flies to Malaga. Not a single business person on board, uh, but, but families of five. And what they want is spaghetti bolognese to keep the kids quiet. Um, so you have to, with the same metal, with the same cabin crew, with the same galley layout, you have to, within three hours to offer two entirely different products. 
And for us to figure out what the customer wants is one way you might go. We just leave the choice to the customer. Our internet booking engine uh, uh, has uh, such a functionality that you can really build your product in a modular way. And also to remind you that this one and the same person might be a business traveler from Monday to Friday and, and, and have a, a, a 180 degrees different demand from Saturday to Sunday. But it isn't the core issue. And, though, I mean, and you, that's you, the reason why we stored our, our revenue base mm -hmm. and uh, what we are now combining, and that is most probably next to uh, uh, JetBlue unique in the world, a full-fledged product, uh, if you w wish, long haul, we connect and all that, uh, all that stuff. Uh, without the complexity. Um, Isn't the core it's issue it's that it's the it's Irish it's market working. is a very, if not ultra, price focused market? We have a, a, a dispersed Irish population yes. around the world, yeah. a lot in the UK. Uh, Ryanair demonstrated uh, as they grew their business model that people who were going on ferries between the UK and Ireland yeah. would fly uh, and people couldn't believe they could get these low fares. You've had to match those, you have had to lower your costs, but coming from a, a legacy background, have you done enough now in cost reduction? Uh, to actually be able to sustain that uh, in your ideal world in an independent way? It's uh, it, airline business and cost is a little bit like jogging. You have to do it every day, um, otherwise you get fat. And that's the reason why it's, it will never end. We can never say we are sufficiently um, uh, productive on our cost base. Technology will help us um, and, and so on and so forth. But let's, let's, let's remind ourselves, um, similar to, uh, to Bertolt talking about Latvia, the, the Irish travel market lost 30% volume in the last three years. Have you ever seen that? I've never ever seen that before. And despite of that market decline, um, we cut capacity by 10%, but we are up for 11% growth this year. And um, so we abandoned market stimulation, even though the Irish market is absolutely tuned to it because it's very, it's most probably the most price sensitive market in Europe. Um, we just leave the customer the choice and it's working quite well. We are demand led mm -hmm. in every um, uh, differentiation of our product, be it the just the transportation fee or the, the added value products we offer. But underpinning the need to cut cost and to, to meet this price sensitive mm -hmm. market, you've had to go through a great deal of pain in terms of uh, staff and workforce. Yes. Um, what I was wondering, especially in the last year, you've had certainly cabin crew disputes, or possibly, if I remember rightly, pilot disputes. We've seen these kind of things coming out of uh, legacy carriers. We've seen the same battle uh, with uh, British Airways and cabin crew. Is that going to come back to haunt you again and again? Do, do, does the workforce understand? Again, if I look at your competitor side by side, of course, Michael O'Leary wouldn't entertain having unions in Ryanair and has mm. a, maybe a hire and fire outlook. Yeah. Can you, can you survive by constantly going, uh, going into battle with your own unions? I believe it is a step change. I mean, uh, let, let's not try to simplify. Our employees, at least uh, a vast majority, joined Erlingus, let's say, maybe 10 or 15 years ago in the strong belief this is a fully owned government entity with all the perks of a civil servant environment. Um, they worked cockpit and cabin around 450, 500 hours. Uh, we ratched that up last year to 850. Uh, what do you expect? I mean, if you wish, the, the contract which was signed 15 years ago uh, is, is not valid. We changed it unilaterally and, and, and that resulted in, in some unhappiness. Um, we negotiated our way through and I have to stress that the support we receive from all our employees, particularly in the presence of the Irish overall economic crisis, is overwhelming. So I wouldn't exaggerate that. It's, it's, it's human, we cope with it, we resolved it, and, uh, and it's done. Will it happen in the future? I don't know, but uh, I believe we are about to embark on a renewed um, um, industrial relation um, quality and uh, I'm, I'm quite convinced the vast majority of our employees have understood that only a profitable airline is uh, safe against a hostile takeover and our employees since last year participate in a, in a gain sharing program uh, with, with every cent we make. And again, the, the backdrop of the Irish economy overall, which, uh, mm. as you were saying, is extremely weak, uh, a, lot, a lot of questions there, a lot of Irish indeed emigrating, uh, 21st century emigration, as we've seen in, in previous centuries. Yeah. We heard again in the previous session about uh, 
pan-European airlines, Ryanair being truly pan-European, mm. EasyJet, mm. others who are not. And again, when I think again about the question of a, a buyer, the Irish market is vast, especially in the UK, but globally in parts of the, the world, such as the US, of course, where you're strong. Mm. But you can't be a, a, a global player. You have home market weakness. Again, what are you doing in terms of strategy and policy to try to overcome this? So do, do you have a high dependence on the Irish market itself for your core revenues, or do you generate revenues elsewhere? Uh, when I joined, the, uh, the uh, proportion was 45% sales abroad, outside the Republic, um, and of course then 55 uh, in the Republic. We turned that around in one and a half years. Currently, we have 55% abroad. No, we tricked a little bit because our, in, our dependence from the Irish market correctly is, is very high. It's too high, in fact. Um, I come to the growth aspect later. Um, what we have done is we've, we switched on connectivity. Um, we have never done that before. Uh, and that works quite well because our low cost position also provides us with the opportunity to price a Dusseldorf, Boston, a Lyon, Chicago absolutely competitive. To our big surprise, we are most competitive in markets with non-stop offerings to those destinations in the US. And that once more uh, underpins that, that uh, particularly our long haul product is extremely competitive. And uh, it's a big success. It's as profitable from the margin as our short haul product. And part of that process of feeding the long haul, uh, we had uh, Paul Schutz on one of the panels yesterday mm. from Air Aaron, now working closely with you. I think yeah. if I remember rightly, he said about 80% of Air Aaron's business is now the, the Aer Lingus Regional. Can you just tell us a bit about uh, the Aer Lingus perspective on that? You've used another airline to do something for you that uh, seemingly yeah. you couldn't do for yourselves. No, I believe the Irish market was, was really um, uh, one fits it all. If you just have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So people were flying to the UK with big equipment, 737 NGs and, and 320s. And as a consequence of that, we had many markets in the UK, traditionally very strong with Ireland, um, served only once a day, which is not an, a, a value proposition for the business traveler. So we reduced the gorge size. We operate with ATR three times a day instead of once. And uh, business customers are just rushing through the door. Um, the product is, is, is very good, so I believe it is a perfect pathfinder concept. has been developed before, it's not our invention. Um, works very, very well and uh, is the main source of our growth this year. And, and is it something as well, I mean, it all sounds very positive, growth mm -hmm. and partnership, but is it, is it profitable? Does it make business profitable, sense? Yes. And is it secure for the future? Air Aaron themselves have gone through uh, financial mm -hmm. uh, examinership in, in Irish law terms, mm -hmm. effectively bankrupt, I mean, coming back out of it. Yeah. Are you confident they're going to remain there as a partner for you and that they're going to get something out of this? As well, as yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a win-win situation, clearly. As you pointed out, my, I, I do not have visibility on their financial statements, but if Paul said yesterday that he's making 80% of his profits with us, well, glad to hear that. Well, profit, 80% of his business. Glad to hear that, um, but, but I believe that's true. Our sales uh, machine is, is much stronger, our brand is much stronger. Um, it's always a very fine line and most probably other legacy carriers in Europe had, had the same. Uh, if you really want to own it, you buy it. Uh, the day after, the ATR pilot dreams about the captain ship on the 320 and the whole thing goes down the drain from a cost position. If you don't own them, they might walk away. So you have to find a commercial agreement which, which clearly uh, puts the incentive uh, right. We found our, and it, it's, it's not a cost plus or something, it's a pure franchise agreement which keeps the air and people also interested in the, in the revenue side of, uh, of the house. And that's, uh, I believe, the recipe to success. Well, we talked as well about the, the, the pan-European aspects. One thing you do which seems to be uh, atypical in, in Europe, you have this ad hoc or oddball flight between Madrid and Washington, which I believe you operate. Oh, it's not ad hoc, uh, it's every day. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, a one-off type uh, service. Uh, tell us about that, because we, we had the, the, the fanfare of open skies mm -hmm. between the US and Europe coming in, mm -hmm. what, a couple or so years ago, and not much happened. We've seen one or two airlines trying to do things outside of their home country. How is it that an Irish airline is operating with an American carrier out of Spain and, and, and 
again, does it make sense? No, the, the story is quite simple. Uh, I, I spent uh, a huge amount of time in the last 15 years uh, helping to negotiate open skies. We have it now since a couple of years between Europe and the United States. And believe it or not, nobody uses it after, after um, years of, of, of discussion. Um, in fact, we saw that niche and uh, we were sitting down with United and say, why don't we combine our low production base, or the cost base, with your strong revenue penetration in the US market. Um, Washington DC is a hub for United, but they've never operated to, um, to Spain because they, they didn't have the right equipment. Uh, 330, 200 is, is our equipment of choice. So it's very simple. We combine our cost position with their revenue position and we are profitable since months number two. It's never been seen on the North Atlantic. Um, our crew is based in Washington DC on uh, local contracts, so US uh, contracts. So, uh, if not pan-European, then, then at least uh, we, we have this specialty. It's, it's looking quite well. Might be a new model. Uh, only obstacle we see are the collective bargaining agreements uh, in the United States, United with their pilots, or United Continental with their pilots. See some difficulties, but uh, it's profitable uh, to cancel it is a, is a very tough call. Is it something you could roll out uh, beyond this, or would that... Uh Union issue again prohibit it? I mean, the, the discussion is, and uh, I, I can certainly quote all uh, CEOs from the, from the big legacy carriers in Europe, uh, they have all stated in the last 12 months, once or twice, that their short haul business is not profitable, that they have to find a solution. Um, the whole thing with feed into the hubs is in, is in tatters from a profitability point of view. Yes, why not? Why don't we think about uh, maybe not under the brand, a lingus? Uh, offering our uplift services at a, at a very attractive cost basis to other carriers. Okay. Again, al alliances, you mentioned br briefly already, uh, Aer Lingus was in one world. I, I can't remember, it came out of that before your time. I think it was before your time. Uh, you've been reflecting again recently about yeah. whether you should get back into an alliance. We, we've heard a lot, lot of debate earlier about mm -hmm. complexity. I sometimes wonder, do consumers really know what alliances are, other than the frequent flyer points? And do airlines really get the best out of them in terms of really working together as a group in terms of cost negotiations, whether yeah. it's uh, with airports, uh, manufacturers and so on. Where is Aer Lingus at the moment about this uh, alliance uh, issue? I, I was uh, happy enough to be part of the Star Alliance uh, founding member 97 and uh, seamless travel, you will all remember, we needed even to explain to the customer uh, what, what code share was. Everybody was a little bit suspicious. Um, technology uh, has overcome all these hurdles today with an interline agreement and through check-in. Uh, you can deliver the same value to the customer without an alliance membership. Secondly, an alliance membership does not come for free. It's very expensive and if I, Aer Lingus, hypothetically would join the Star Alliance, I'll pick that as an example because it's the largest one, um, just to negotiate reciprocity in, in code share and frequent flyer pros with 26 carriers of the world, I would have to employ 100 people to do that. I don't have them and I won't join. Um, so, uh, reason number three, which is most probably the most important one, our business traveler uh, share is 15% of our overall traffic. So I throw a lot of money after a very small population of my customer base as opposed to let's say a carrier like Lufthansa or Swiss with 40 to 50%. So it's simply not delivering for me at the current let's say, price list. Um, mm -hmm. I see some movement in all three alliances um, in, in um, maybe diminishing the bureaucracy because that has mushroomed. Uh, uh, they have all big organizations with big head offices, um, all very expensive looking stuff. Um, it's, it's not our game. It's not our game. We have to be stay modest. Uh, low cost is our, is our dogma. How we present our product is a different thing. We are not perceived as a low cost carrier. Um, our customers tell us 80 plus percent uh, that they don't see us as a low cost carrier and we have to just follow that. Okay. Let's go to the floor, Christoph, and see if somebody from the audience would like to uh, ask you a question. If somebody could just put their hand up, do they have a question? down the back. Well, I'll ask you another one in that case, then, Christoph. Um, just looking at the wider challenging issues, I mean, we, we haven't talked about fuel price uh, in, in this session. I mean, that's affecting everybody. Uh, I don't know where Erlingus is in terms of its hedging position. 
Do you see fuel prices uh, as something you're going to be able to manage for the long term? Uh, do you assume we're going to see up and down in price or are we going to have to accept longer term higher prices? Um, normally you see a very strong correlation between the fuel price and the global economy and, and you see the uh, more careful predictions for the United States immediately showed an effect on the, on the fuel price. Um, difficult to say. If I would know, I would be a rich man. Um, no, I believe the biggest challenge I see going forward is certainly the overall macroeconomic climate in Europe, uh, particularly in Ireland and the UK. Um, discretionary spend for vacation is on decline and we don't see the seabed yet, particularly here in the UK. So I believe careful capacity management is, is paramount for the industry. Um, over and above that, we just have to manage it. We managed a decline of 30% in our market, 10% our own capacity. We did it in a profitable way. It cannot go on forever. There is absolutely no doubt. You cannot shrink yourself out of the misery. Um, but I hope that um, um, at least we have reached a um, a, a sustainable demand level uh, in Ireland and I hope that for the rest of Europe it, it at least is a small growth uh, signal. Okay, and in terms of the fuel specifically, I mean, mm. uh, are you in the market for new generation aircraft at this point? Not yet. Our fleet is only 5.8 years old, so we have relatively uh, new equipment um, and our order book uh, projects that even the average age will come down in the foreseeable future. But nevertheless, we have to look, look into new technology. We are interested in that. And uh, with regard to fuel on our long haul services, we can charge a fuel surcharge, but again, that cannot go on forever. So. We believe that with our very systematic rolling fuel hedging uh, uh, system, uh, we cannot protect ourselves against high fuel prices in the long run. But what we can do is we can ask the question, are all customers prepared next summer to pay this premium for the fuel surcharge? If we answer that question with no, we step on the brakes with regard to capacity. That's the only thing we can do in that respect. Okay, and again, what the point you made, a very uh, important one, I think, about the state of the European economies, mm. and particularly uh, those that you're most exposed to, UK and Ireland. Uh, do you have any kind of doomsday scenario where you've calculated uh, what you would do if it was further fall in economic activity than what we've seen already, or indeed going beyond that to the US, which is also pretty fragile and an important market for you? Yeah, the, the interesting um, lesson learned, and there are not that many def de uh, examples of, let's say, a default of one or the other economy, um, the, um, the shock effect is very deep, but very short, in fact. The recuperation kicks in after six to nine months, so that, that is most probably something we have to look into, and we are currently doing that. Uh, I do not expect drastic things, but it's about to survive a, a short a trough, uh, a significant but short trough in, in, in demand. Uh, but again, I think Ireland is, uh, is, is, is on the right path uh, currently. Okay. One more chance for a question to Christoph. Please, in the back. Somebody over here. And to yeah. the right in the back. Yeah. Yeah, hi, hi I'm, I'm over here. I think we've got a couple. Um, yeah, it's Neil Pakey from Vancouver Airport Services. It's just like something Carolyn alluded to earlier on. Uh, that we've not picked up on, which is, a, is the different tax regimes across uh, Europe. Um, and I'm interested to, to know if, um, you know if the different tax regimes has affected at all your route, uh, your route decisions, whether you've not gone into a market because of um, excessive government tax or you have because there isn't. Um, and uh, obviously the Irish have got a particular case because they've reduced theirs and, but still have one. Yeah, I think uh, there were a few governments experimenting with that. I always like to take the Dutch uh, government as an example because they learned it very, very quick that an additional uh, APD uh, is detrimental to, to demand. They, s they scrapped it after they saw traffic is going to Liège, to, uh, to Vez, to, uh, to all other airports, the closest airports to the Dutch border. 
Um, the German government seems to be more stubborn in, 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 in um, just ignoring facts of life. Um, the Irish government is somewhere in between. We came down from 10 to 3 and uh, still some arm twisting going on. We have to live, obviously, for the time being with the 3 euro, uh, not appreciated, uh, in fact, um, because if every carrier in the world would make 3 euro in profit, we would be a fantastic uh, profitable industry. Um, but that's all I can say. Uh, with, with a little bit um, disbelief, I see the plans of the UK government to increase it uh, further. That, that is basically uh, in, in conjunction with no further runway uh, here around London. Um, Willie called it laughable. I, I would support that statement. In addition to that, we have the uh, ETS coming in next year, or plan yeah. to come in. Uh, and what is the Aer Lingus, uh, uh, public point of view on that? Obviously not in favour. We, we fought that for, for many years in, um, in, in Brussels. Uh, we have never been for it because we always argued that the uh, fuel saving as such is incentive enough for an airline to be very careful in, in, in burning uh, fuel. Um, now we have it. Um, I'm observing with a lot of interest what the Chinese and the US uh, carers are doing in that respect. I believe we are just starting the next round on that debate. Okay. Any more questions from the room? Yeah, the gentleman over here. Oh, I think it's Rigas to Oh, that's a shout. No, Max, <laughs> just coming your way now. Um, my name is Rigas to I, I think, uh, Christoph, you're in a unique position. Uh, as an airline in having had to face low-cost competition through Iron Air head-on and you've adapted in ma many ways to that competition. So my question, I have two questions. How successful have you been in, in facing up to, to, to Ryan Air? And secondly, given that other traditional airlines in Europe are facing increasing competition from low-cost carriers, what would you advise them to do? Yeah, well, I think the first question I answered, uh, we, we, we left the choice at which fare uh, the customer wants to travel to the customer. Uh, you can have the seat only and our pricing point is equal or very similar to Ryanair. We have, uh, in, in quoting Thomas, uh, one advantage, we are not flying into the forest, we are flying to places known as Charles de Gaulle or Frankfurt, Maine and, and so on and so forth. Um, just that, I believe, our customer uh, perceive as, as absolutely good value for money. So if we are 10 euro higher than Ryanair, it's a lot. In most cases, we are, we, are, we are equal. And then we play a little bit with pricing and deal management, which, of course, is a, a little bit our secret. Um, what I would advise the other carriers in Europe, nothing. Uh, it's not, I'm not paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, 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 I quoted my, my first, my second quarter, which is not the strongest quarter, had already a margin of 7.4% this year. We had an overall full uh, fiscal year margin of 5% last year. If you benchmark that with the global airline industry, we are in the, in the, in the top 10% of profitability. Christoph, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close there. So we very much appreciate you coming along today. Uh, we wish you good luck with your upcoming challenges and we will hope to invite you back next year to see uh, who your shareholders are at that point. Christoph Muller, thank Thanks, you very John. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.